All right, all right. Good morning, everybody. Come on, aren't you glad to be at church today? I'm glad you're here. Uh, no better place to be. Uh, we're in a series called Summer Sundays. Many of you know that. Maybe this is your first time here with us. Typically, uh, we teach through, pretty systematically, through series uh, each month. And uh, a few years ago, we started doing this series called Summer Sundays. And it just gives you an opportunity as a church to hear from some different voices. So you've heard already for some different voices within our church uh, all month long already. Uh, often it's an opportunity for you to hear from outside voices in our church as well, overseers and things like that. And today we've got one of our brand new overseers here with us today, Pastor David Ware, pastors a church in Pell City called Victory Church. Come on, if you've uh, seen that before, going to Atlanta, you can't miss the building right off the interstate. Uh, he's become an, a really good friend of ours and our church. And I'm just honored that He's here with us today. He's got his family with him. So come on, put your hands together and welcome him to the platform. He's got an incredible word for you. All right, Cultivate Church, how are you doing today? You good? All right, you're going to give me some encouragement this morning? Okay, I, I, I need it. It's good to be with you. I'm so um, grateful for your pastors. You know, um, I became a senior pastor at Victory in 2012, and I'd been a Christian school educator my whole adult life, and and when I started pastoring, I realized I just didn't know any pastors. I'd spent my whole life with principals, and so uh, we joined ARC back then because I was looking for friends, and I tell you, th there's no better friends than your pastors. Pastor Brandon and, uh, and Danielle and pastors Brandon and, and Jen, they are such good friends to the church. I don't know if you know that, but they're so encouraging. They love you, but they love the the church, the Big C Church. And so could we just honor them? Could you just clap for them? You're so blessed here. You're so blessed. And so, listen, to serve you guys as an overseer is such an honor and just to be with you. And so, um, you know, it's, it's uh, and you're not too far away. Sometimes, you know, you go speak somewhere else, you got to stay in a hotel. But I just drove over this morning. It was great. It's good to be in the same state. Hey, my family are with me. My wife, Emily, daughter, Susanna, son, Ben are right here. And uh, so it's good, good to have all of us uh, here with you. We, um, we, we do live in Pell City. We've been, Emily and I have been on staff at Victory Church since 1994. So we got married. We met at Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, got, got married and moved back to Pell City, which is her hometown, and went on staff as teachers. Emily was a first grade teacher. I was teaching high school. And we just stayed there. 29 years we've been married. 29 years we've been serving our church. And, uh, and it's just been an incredible blessing. And, uh, and our kids uh, are both, uh, well, Ben's already finished with, with college. He went to ORU and uh, got an, an electrical engineering degree. And Susanna's going, uh, this will be her senior year. She's an elementary ed major. So we're, we're an all ORU family, I guess, right here. But, um, you know, serving the Lord together as a family is such a joy, isn't it? Like parents, just keep your kids in church. Teach them how to love the Lord. And I promise you that the word's true. He's going to take care of them. Uh, and that's what we've experienced as a family. Uh, it, you, you probably haven't gathered this by listening to me, but I was, I'm actually British. I'm a, I'm a dual citizen, British and American. I, I moved to America when I was 18 to go to ORU. I felt like the Lord called me into ministry and uh, heard about this Christian college in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, uh, and so I uh, immigrated when I was 18 years old. So I did have a, an English accent back then. People ask me all the time, what happened to your English accent? And I say, uh, 29 years in Pell City, Alabama, destroyed it. <laughs> destroyed it. And, um, but you know, I like to talk about how grateful I am for this country. Because as an immigrant, I can tell you, America has been so good to me. And, uh, and serving the Lord here and, and building a family here. And uh, so I tell people I'm not from Alabama, but I got here as soon as I could. <laughs> and, um, you know, what, a, what an amazing place to serve the Lord and to, and to raise a, a family in church. And I'm so thankful for, for our state and for this area. Uh, it does make me laugh, though, because people, because all my friends, you know, they want me to do English accents and stuff. And sometimes it comes out, but for the most part, I, I've managed to get rid of all of it because... When I was teaching high school, I would say something with a British accent and my students would laugh at me. So I started working on it to try to get those, the accent out so that they would notice. And so one time, I think one of the, the last words that I managed to fix, I was teaching, I was reading to my English class 
And, uh, and I said a word, and they all started laughing. And I said, what is it? What's so funny? And they said, that word you just said, what was that word? And I looked back on it, and I said, squirrel? And they go, oh, they laugh like crazy, squirrel, you know, squirrel. They just kept saying it. I said, well, how do you say it? And so they told me how to say it, and I couldn't, I couldn't copy it. Listen, it took me five years to learn how to say y'all. So, so, so I could not understand what they were saying. So finally, one of my students gets up. He says, give me the marker, Mr. Weir. And so he takes the marker, and he writes on the board S-K-E. R, what was it? S-K-E-R-W-L or something. I go, and I look at it and go, squirrel. He goes, that's it, you got it. <laughs> squirrel. Thank goodness for, for students that don't let you get away with anything. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, I just want to let you know who we are and uh, how much we love your pastors and your church and just, uh, just uh, being together in fellowship. And I have a message for you today on hope. A few months ago, the Lord was just talking to me out of this passage in 1 Corinthians. If you have your Bible app or your Bible, why don't you turn to that, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I was reading this verse, and I thought, you know, I've taught a lot of messages on hope. I mean on faith, excuse me. I've taught a lot of messages on love, on how much God loves us and how we're supposed to love each other. I hadn't taught a lot of messages on hope. And here it is in 1 Corinthians 13, and... And I was just asking the Lord about it, so he, he just taught me a lot about hope lately. So I thought, you know, this is what I think about today. I'm here to stir hope up in your heart. And I think faith and love are stirred up every time you come to church, but, but I'm here specifically to teach you something about hope, to stir it up on the inside of you. Because this is what Paul says to the church in Corinth. You know, church, every time you read these letters, you know, Corinthians, Thessalonians, Galatians, could we just remember that these letters, they were written down by Paul, but, but the words come from the Holy Spirit to the church? Did you know that? So we call it 1 Corinthians because it was the first letter that the Holy Spirit sent to the church in Corinth. But the thing is, you're the church today, and the Word of God is alive. And so these words, even though they were written a long time ago, they were written for you because you're the church today. So the Holy Spirit knew what you were going to need today. So he wrote you a letter. So, so don't forget, every time you read these letters in the New Testament, they're letters to the church. And you're the church. So you need it. So this is what he says to you today. And now abide faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So let's think about this verse for a minute. It says these things abide. What does that mean? It means they live in you. So as a Christian, there are three spiritual realities living on the inside of you. Faith, hope, and love. They're in you as a Christian. They're there. So, so sometimes you have to stir them up. Sometimes you have to stir love up in you. Sometimes you have to stir up faith in you. And sometimes you have to stir up hope. So that's, that's what I'm here to do. See, what happened was, before you got saved, these three things didn't live in you. These three things are a result of being born again. I just like to remind myself sometimes about what happened in the garden, that when Adam sinned, you know, he was born. When he was born, God created his body, but then he breathed his life into him. Like when, when he made him, he made him alive physically and spiritually. So here's this man created out of the dust of the ground, and then God whoosh, breathes his spirit into that man. So Adam and Eve are walking around in the garden, and, they, and they're alive physically, but they're fully alive spiritually. They have the Spirit of God on the inside of them. And then the devil comes and tempts them, and when they sin, what happened was they died spiritually. Not physically that day. The Bible says Adam lived 900 some years. But they died the moment they rebelled against God. The Spirit of God had to leave that physical body, and they're, and they're walking around spiritually dead. Are, are you with me? You know this is, this is what happened? And so when God, God's plan was to send his son to live a perfect life and die on the cross to pay for the sin that separates man from God. So the day you said yes to Jesus, what happened to you? God breathed his spirit back into you. It happened like that. The moment that you believed in your heart that Jesus died and rose for you and you gave him your life and called him your Lord, that's what happened. Something supernatural happened in that moment. God went, 
And he breathed his spirit back into you. So you're walking around on this earth with the Holy Spirit of God on the inside of you. And, and along with that, you've got faith and hope and love in you. Wherever you go, they abide in you. So I'm going to teach you about this a little bit today. So turn to 1 Thessalonians. Here's another letter to the church written by Paul, and it touches on this same subject. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let me read a little bit of it to you to put it in context. He says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all. Should be all. Making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope. Now I'm going to come back to verse 3 several times to show this to you in context. In our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Let's keep reading. Verse 4. Knowing, beloved brethren, Christians, believers, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. As you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. And your faith towards God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry or welcome we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And let's look at verse 10. It says, And to wait, to wait for his Son. From heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. You know that one day the, the wrath of God, the just anger of God is going to be poured out on this earth? Did you know that? But like right now, we're living in this church age, this age where as believers we have a chance to reach as many people with the gospel of Jesus Christ as we can. I'm not really teaching on this today, but then what's going to happen? Jesus is going to come back for us, and the church are going to meet him in the clouds. It's what we call the rapture. And that, that's when the wrath of God, the tribulation, will be the wrath of God. Do you know that we're safe from that? Do you know as a church we, we don't experience the wrath of God? God's not going to pour his wrath out on his children. Isn't that good news? Because of Jesus. All right, so let me teach you about these three abiding spiritual realities. Number one. And if you have some notes, I'd write these down because I think they'll help you in the future. Number one, faith is demonstrated in my life by action. So church, there are three abiding spiritual realities in me, faith, hope, and love. And according to Paul in 1 Thessalonians, he says, faith is, I see the faith through actions. Let's read it again. It says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your action that goes along with faith. How do I know that I'm a man of faith? Not just, not just because I say it, but because I act on my faith. The, the work of faith, the actions of faith. Let me, let me read another passage to you, James chapter 2. Now someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I'll show you my faith by my good deeds or by my works. You you say you have faith, for you believe that there's one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. So, so listen to me, church. I'm going to get to hope in just a minute. I just want to make sure we see all three. Faith is an abiding reality in me. And the way I demonstrate my faith is through my actions, through my response to what God says. So I read my Bible, and I hear God's Word, and He speaks to my heart, and when I hear Him speak, I do something about it. I don't just hear it, I do something, right? That's my response, my action. I'll give you a good example. When Emily and I got married, we were 22 years old. I didn't know what the Lord wanted to do with my life. So I was working at Parisian in Irondale. Does anybody remember Parisian? Anybody old enough? Okay, a few people. All right. 
So I didn't know what to do with my life. I mean, I had a, a college degree, but I, I didn't know what the Lord wanted me to do. So, so I was, well, first I was selling women's shoes at that store. Let me tell you, that is hard work. <laughs> if you remember that store, that, that women's shoe department went on for days. And, and what happens when you sell women's shoes? Now, I'm sorry, ladies, it's just true. Okay, so you can tell me after church if this isn't true, but I think you know it's true. So what they do is they come and they show you uh, five shoes that they want to try on. And they, all, they want to try them on in three different sizes. <laughs> so you're carrying 15 boxes out of the store. It took, it took 20 minutes to find them, you know. And then you get out there and you got these 15 boxes and they try them all on. And then they say, you know, I think I'm, I'm going to think about it. And they go have a cup of coffee or something and come back later and you go through it all again. That's how you sell women's shoes. So then they moved me to men's shoes. In men's shoes, this is what happens. A man walks up, he says, hey, I want this shoe in a size 11. And you go and you get it, you bring it out, and you say, you want to try it on? And the man says, no, I've been wearing that shoe for 20 years. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> oh, it was a relief when they put me in men's shoes. <laughs> what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, faith. So, so I'm working at Parisians. And I don't know what the Lord wants me to do, so I decided to fast for three days. Now, I had never fasted for three days before, and I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was so desperate to hear from God that for three days I fasted. And on the third day of the fast, the Lord told me to teach. And I said, well, Lord, I, I didn't go to school to be a teacher. I had to go back and get my master's. But, I, but he said, I want you to teach. Like he planted it in my heart. I can't even explain it. It was a, a desire that I didn't think was there before. But on the third day of that fast, it, was, it just came in my heart. So look at our church. We had a K-12 through school. We, we, we still do. We have about 450 students in K-12 through at Victory. So uh, after work, I go to my pastor's office. I walk in and said, hey, I, you know, the Lord just told me today to teach. So I thought I'd better come talk to you. And he told me a high school English teacher just quit that day. So I stepped into a teaching position like that. I had to learn on the go. I had to go back and get some, some other classes. But I had a degree in English Lit from, from England. So do you see what I'm saying? Like I heard God say something to me. Now if I refuse to respond to it, I'd still be, work well, I'd be working at Belk right now. <laughs> so he... I believed he was, if I thought, if I fast, he'll speak to me, I'll hear his voice. So I fasted, he spoke to me, and then I had to go and do something. Does that make sense? So faith is demonstrated in my life by action. So come on, church, whatever he tells you to do, just go do it. I promise he'll work it out. You don't have to understand it. I didn't. You just do it. Here's number two. Love is demonstrated in my life by labor. By labor. That's what he says in verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love. So my love for God is demonstrated through labor. My love for my family is demonstrated through labor. You, you know if you have kids, you love your kids and you work hard for them. Right? Is anybody working hard for their kids? Can you tell me? Yes or no? Okay, I know you are. So... My love for the church is demonstrated through labor. So when Emily and I went to the church when we were 22 years old and the pastor came to me and he said, hey, could you teach Sunday school for me? It was back when we had Sunday school. And I said, sure, what grades? He said, third and fourth grade. I said, okay. So every Sunday morning before church, you know, before the service, I'd teach Sunday school, th uh, third and fourth graders. And then later on, he, they came and said, hey, we need somebody to step up and do fifth and sixth grade. I said, sure, I'll teach fifth and sixth grade. I did that. So I did that for years. Then they came and they said, hey, we, we don't have a bass player. We think if we teach you how to play bass, you could play. I'm like, I've never played anything other than tennis and golf. You know, so I said, okay, fine. So the worship pastor taught me how to play bass. And for 10 years, y'all, I played bass in our band for 10 years. Every service. Why? Because it was a labor of love. I love the church. The church is God's family. The church is, is, is the body of Christ. I love Jesus, so I love the church. So it's, it's a labor of love. And then they came and said, hey, could you teach four and five-year-old boys on Wednesday night? I said, let me pray about that. 
I said yes, but you know, that's a labor of love to take care of. We had a good time. We would, we would play dodgeball and I would teach them their Bible verse. And, but you understand what I'm saying? Like I just kept saying yes to whatever the church needed because I love the church. And, and you express, you demonstrate your love through labor. That's what Paul says. So let me get to the third one. The third one is hope. And hope is demonstrated in my life by patience. By patience. Another word would be perseverance. How do I know that my heart is full of hope? I never give up. Sometimes in my life I've thought, well, this isn't going well, but you know the worst thing that could possibly happen? Jesus loves me. He's going to take care of me. Hope. I have this hope that lives in me because Jesus lives in me. I have a hope that can't go away because I'm a born-again believer on my way to heaven. That hope, so sometimes I have to stir it up, especially when things aren't going well. I have to stir up that hope in my heart and remember that if I'm just patient, if I could just wait, if I could not give up, then I'll see God do something amazing. If I could just hold on for another day or another week or another month. Listen, there were times when I started passing the church, I would think, if you could just hold on for five years, <laughs> you'll be okay. You know, like, there's a hope in me that, that is because Jesus is in me. And, and, the, and I demonstrate that hope by being patient. Hey, let me give you a definition of hope really quickly. And, I, and I'm going to move on to this last verse. But hope is the confident expectation of the goodness of God that even on my worst day I have this confidence that I'm going to see him do something good that's hope so as a believer you should be expecting God to do something good in your life every day I'm not saying bad things don't happen I'm not saying that we don't go through difficult times I'm saying even in the difficult times I'm confident I'm going to see him do something good there's a way we used to say this back in college that you know that that um, Horror Roberts really taught the whole country how to say this. We would say, something good is going to happen to you today. That's hope. Can we say that together? Can you say this after me? Say, something good is going to happen to me today. That's hope. Let's do it one more time. It just sounds so good when you say it. Say, something good is going to happen to me today. That is biblical hope that belongs to every Christian. All right, one more passage, Romans chapter 5. Let me show you how to grow that hope in your heart in Romans 5. Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Verse 3, Not only that, But we glory in tough times, tribulations, knowing that that tough time that you're going through is going to produce perseverance, and that perseverance is going to produce character, and that character is going to produce hope. So church, listen to me. Hope grows in your heart when you refuse to quit. Perseverance. That's how hope grows. How do I have so much hope today? It's grown in my heart through years of perseverance. I have more hope today than I've ever had in my life because my whole adult life as a born-again Christian, I refuse to quit. I refuse. I refuse. I will not give up on God's plan for me. I will not. I don't care how bad things are, how tough things are. There have been some tough, difficult, difficult days. Leading a church, being a, a Christian school principal, just living in this world. I refuse to quit on God's plan. 29 years, Emily and I have been serving the same church. Why? Because that's where God called us, and we're not going anywhere. And tough times come and go, but Jesus remains, and the hope in me has grown because I I never quit. And now the Lord uses me to encourage other pastors, younger pastors. And if if I had quit on the calling of God in my life, I wouldn't be in this place. I wouldn't be here to serve you as an overseer. Are you listening to me? The plan that God has for your life is so much bigger than you could possibly imagine. And your part is to to keep yourself stirred up with faith and love and hope. And that's what I'm here to stir up in you today. And I'm going to pray for you. And if you've been thinking about quitting, I don't know what. Your job, maybe. 
your marriage, quitting on the church. Unless the Holy Spirit tells you to, to, to quit that job, you better stay where you are. I'm just telling you from experience. You fast and pray. Don't quit. Stay faithful. So I'm going to pray about that. And then the second thing I want to pray for is if there's anybody in this room and you would say, Pastor David, I don't know if I'm a born-again Christian. I mean, I've gone to church a lot, but I don't know if I'm a born-again Christian. You can be born again today. The day that you say yes to Jesus, God breathes his spirit into you and you become alive on the inside. So let's pray about that too. Will you bow your heads for a minute? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, you sent me here to stir up hope in this church, to stir up hope in this body of believers. So right now, would you stir hope up in them? God, there's somebody in this room. Lord, there's several people in this room who've been on the very brink of giving up on something that you specifically told them to do. So I'm praying for them right now. Stir hope in their, up in their hearts. Something good is going to happen to them. God, they're going to see your goodness and be encouraged to stay the course. Stir hope up in us. Just with your heads bowed, maybe there's somebody in this room you, you need to say yes to Jesus today. It could be that you're here and you would say, well, I'm a Christian, but I haven't been living for God. Okay, then the Holy Spirit is calling you today back into a close relationship with Jesus. That's what he's doing. So I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. It's really similar to the prayer that my dad led me in when I was five years old. He led me to Jesus. So why don't you let me lead you to him right now? I think there's somebody that would say, I, you know, I never had a dad that led me to Jesus. Okay, I'm standing in his place right now to lead you to the Lord, to lead you into a brand new life, just like the people that were baptized today. So I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. And if you'll pray this with me and mean it from your heart, you can be saved right now in this room. You can be born again. Hey, church, will you help me pray this out loud? I think there's somebody in this room who desperately wants Jesus. Would you pray this? Everybody in the room, just pray after me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son to die for me so I could be forgiven. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. And I confess Jesus Christ is my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.